Income tax 2023-2024. Alimony received. Get ready and some coffee because we're looking to get the tax man off our back with income tax preparation 2022-2023. Most of this information can be found in the Instructions for Schedule 1 section of the Form 1040 Instructions Tax Year 2023, which you can find on the IRS website at irs.gov, irs.gov. Looking at the income tax formula, we're focused on line one income. Remember, in the first half of the income tax formula, it's basically a funny income statement. Normally, income statements having income minus expenses resulting in net income. Here we have income minus various deductions resulting in taxable income. With the income line item for taxes, we want it as low as possible, therefore looking for things that we might be able to exclude from income. And some income line items might be taxed at more favorable rates other than ordinary income. Examples possibly being qualified dividends, long-term capital gains. This is the first page of the Form 1040. We're looking at line number eight, which has an attached schedule, which is the Schedule 1. This is the Schedule 1, additional income and adjustments to income. We're looking at line number two, related to alimony received. Okay, so first thing we want to note with the alimony is there basically have been changes to it over time. Whenever there are changes to uh, the tax law, often the problem is that you have to make the change from one point going forward because you don't want to retroactively mess up things that happened in the past. So what happens oftentimes is a law is made, it's put in place, people make plans based on that law, and then when you want to change it, possibly simplifying the code in the future becomes difficult because if you... First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our crunchy numbers is my cardio product line. Now, I'm not saying that subscribing to this channel, crunching numbers with us, will make you thin, fit, and healthy or anything. However, it does seem like it worked for her. Just saying. So, you know, subscribe, hit the bell thing, and buy some merchandise. So you can make the world a better place by sharing your accounting instruction exercise routine. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Put the change in retroactively. It's going to mess up people's planning in the past. We have a situation like that with regards to alimony. So alimony payments have undergone significant changes with respect to federal income tax laws, especially after the Tax Cut and Jobs Act the TCJA of 2017. The rules around the taxation of alimony payments depend on when the divorce or separation instrument, such as divorce decree or separation agreement, was executed or modifies. Here's a detailed discussion for tax year 2023. Now, the general idea you would think with regards to alimony, what what is alimony? it's going to be a payment from one spouse to another. So if you have a divorce kind of situation, people are married, then they get divorced. If in a normal situation, you might have one of the people involved, the spouse, one spouse that spent more time taking care of the family possibly, and the other one doing a lot of uh, the work, earning the wages. The idea in that situation would be that both were supporting uh, the family, but the one that was earning the wages is going to be continuing to earn the wages, you know, in the future. So if the so then the question is, how are you going to divvy up in a divorce situation the earnings? And uh, one way is with alimony distributions. Now, there's always been a big uh, tax issue with regards to something being called alimony versus the child support. Because for taxes, you have the question of, is the person who's paying the money able to take a deduction, which would be good for taxes? uh, And is the person that's receiving the money having or required to report the money in income? 
Now, just like any other kind of transaction, when we see something like an employee paying an employer, for example, not that those two situations are the same, it's just that when you have a payee and a payer, you can see the structure. The IRS is gonna go after the one that's paying the money because they're the one that can possibly get a deduction. The deduction for paying the money is a tax benefit and so and they're going to want then the other person that's receiving the money to have to record it as income they're going to pressure the payer to rat out the person that received the money so that the irs makes sure they get their money from someone in an employer employee situation for example the employer wants to deduct the wages they pay to the employee and to do that the IRS requires them to file a form W-2 and actually do withholdings so that the IRS knows who got the money so that the IRS says, you, you're okay with that deduction as long as I can go after the recipient. So are they gonna do that same thing in a divorce situation? One spouse is paying the other. The question would generally be, does the one paying get a deduction? If they did, you would expect the symmetry to be that the one receiving would have to report it as income. And so that would be bad for the recipient and good for the one that is paying. Uh, now for child support, they basically came up with the idea that we're not going to do that. We're just going to stay out of it. But for alimony, they said they were going to do that. Basically, that was the old law, which made, I think, the divorce settlements a bit more complex because now you have to take into account the complexities of deduction situations. And so I think... Uh, they might have made a good idea here to just remove the tax situation on both child support and alimony so you don't have these games that are played between allocating something between child support and alimony. However, if the agreement was made before the change was made, even if it was a good change, then then you don't want to retroactively go back and, and do that and adjust those agreements because... Uh, they have already taken into consideration the tax implications between alimony and child support. So you make it from the current point going forward. That's the general idea. So alimony received. If you receive alimony under such an agreement, it is not considered taxable income and you should not include it in your income on your tax return for the year 2023. So if the divorce, so this is for divorce separation agreements executed after December 31st, 2018 after the new rules in place, the new rule basically being the government's gonna stay out of it, right? <laughs> and not, and so get out of both child support and alimony. So the person paying doesn't get the deduction and the person receiving doesn't have to include it in income. That would be the easy thing to do. You might say that's, well, that wouldn't be as, as fair to the person that's paying possibly because they would have the tax benefit, but you would think it would just make it easier to, to, to actually create the divorce agreement because now you don't have the added complexity. So I would think the change in benefits would then be reflected in the change in numbers to the divorce agreement, which should be easier to do, you would think. So alimony paid. Similarly, if you pay alimony under an agreement executed after this date, you cannot deduct these payments from your income. So no deduction and no including in income, even if it's alimony rather than the child support. So this change represents a significant shift from previous tax law where alimony received was taxable and alimony paid could be deducted. So alimony agreements executed before January 1st, 2019. So you might be saying, especially if you're the one paying alimony, you're saying, hey, look, I, I had to execute the agreement and I get the deduction, I'm, I having to, I'm having to pay all this money, but the reason I was okay with that is because at least I got a tax deduction for it, might be some people's situation. And if the agreement was made before the law change, you know, that makes sense, right? So they, so because, because that's what they was agreed on. So before that date, for agreements executed before January 1st, 2019, the old rules apply unless their agreement was modified after this date and explicitly states that the TCJA rules apply. Under the old rules, alimony received, if you are receiving alimony based on an agreement executed before January 1st, 2019, you must include these payments in your taxable income for 2023. So this is something that, of course, we have to kind of understand because there should be symmetry between the two partners, meaning if one partner gets to get the deduction, 
they have an incentive to want to take the deduction. If they take the deduction, they're going to put the social security number of the person they paid, the spouse or ex-spouse, on the tax return, just as the person who has an employee who wants the deduction for wages has to issue a W-2 to the IRS. Uh, and that means that the person that receives the money is going to have to record it on their income or else they'll probably get some kind of letter because they will have received something similar to a W-2 form, right, from the other spouse who claimed the deduction. So clearly what would be best, of course, would, would be to have things as clear as possible between both spouses so that they have uh, something that makes sense on both tax returns. Uh, obviously that communication can be difficult, uh, especially when the lawyers get involved and whatnot, but, but that would make it the easiest thing to do generally if it was possible. So alimony paid. If you are paying alimony under such an agreement, you are generally allowed to deduct these payments from your income. Again, look at the date. This is prior to the date. Modifications to agreements. So if a divorce or separation agreement was modified after December 31st, 2018, and the modification expressly states that the alimony payments are not deductible by the pay or, or included in the income of the recipient, then the TCJA uh, rules apply to the modified agreement. So you came up with an agreement before and it was under the old rules. Now you modify it. Be careful. Be careful modifying it because this is a significant impact. Make sure that you're taking that into consideration with the modifications. And what the, the change would be that it would be a bit, you know, it's a, the, the new rules are beneficial to the recipient who doesn't have to include the, in, the money in income and detrimental to the one that is paying. So therefore, if you modify the agreement, you would think you would take that into consideration and come up with an agreement uh, based on the new, the new landscape, right? Which should be easier to do. But child support versus alimony. It's important to distinguish between alimony and child support payments as child support payments are not deductible by the payer and are not to taxable to the recipient regardless of when the agreement was executed or modified. This was always the issue before because they were sneaky. It seems to me they can do like sneaky things and not expressly state as to whether something is alimony or child support. And then we have to do kind of tests to see whether or not the payments that were agreed upon going from one spouse to the other qualifies child support and alimony, which was a pain and could cause further litigation, which again only feeds the the, the lawyers uh, eating, you know, the filet mignon in their in their their hundred thousand dollar car or something, you know. So so we try to make it simple here. Reporting requirements. For agreements executed before 2019 where alimony is deductible by the payer and taxable to the recipient, the recipient must report alimony received as income. The payer can deduct alimony paid if they itemize deductions on uh, Form 1040 Schedule 1. So once again, we're just looking at the line instructions now. This is for agreements executed before 2019. And notice the form, if they itemize deductions on Form 1040 Schedule 1, we're not talking about uh, the Schedule A. So uh, for post-2018 agreements, and we'll talk about the deductible half uh, later as well. We're kind of focused on the income side, but you can see the symmetry between uh, the two, right? right? If one gets the deduction, the other, well, you would think would have to record it as income. So for post-2018 agreements, since alimony is neither deductible nor taxable, there are no specific reporting requirements related to alimony payments on federal income tax returns for either party. So lines 2A and 2B. So now we're specifically looking at the lines alimony received line 2A. Enter amounts received as alimony or separate maintenance pursuant to a divorce or separation agreement entered into on or before December 31st, 2018, unless that agreement was changed after December 31st, 2018 to expressly provide that alimony received isn't included in your income. Alimony received is not included in your income if you entered into a divorce or separation agreement after December 31st, 2018. If you are including alimony in your income, you must let the person who made the payments know of your uh, social security number. So, so again, it's just like when you issue a 1099, right? They got to have the social security number because they're going to rat you out 
because they have to to get if they want the deduction. If you don't to the IRS, they're going to rat you out to the IRS with your social security number. So if you don't, if you don't, you may have to pay a penalty for more details. You can see publication 504. So if you are including alimony payments from more than one divorce or separation agreement uh, in your income, enter the total of all alimony received on line uh, 2A. Line 2B. So on line 2B, enter the month and year of your uh, original divorce or separation agreement that relates to the alimony payment, if any, reported on line 2A. So now the IRS wants the date because the date will help the IRS to determine if it was properly reported as income given that cutoff date. If you have alimony payments that are more than one divorce or separation agreement on line 2B, enter the month or year of the divorce or separation agreement for which you receive the most income. Attach a statement listing the month and year of the other agreement. So if you've got a bunch, if you're receiving, if you've got like 10, 10 people paying you alimony support, <laughs> then, then you, but there's not enough room on the box in the form so you might have to have another added addendum form listing all the listing all those uh those individuals paying paying out the alimony or at least the dates the dates for all the all the uh all the uh, uh, uh divorce agreements okay